five, four, three, two, one, ignition, and liftoff of Soho and... Cape Canaveral, Florida, December 2nd, 1995. An Atlas II rocket takes off from its launch pad. It is carrying the SOHO satellite. Vehicle responses look good. Vehicle responses look good at this time. Listening now to Skip Mackey and some systems now coming off the stop. SOHO is the result of collaboration between the European Space Agency and NASA. Its mission? To travel far from Earth and continuously observe our star, the Sun. On board, a set of instruments scan, probe, measure, and analyze this ball of incandescent gas that is simultaneously emitting radiation and matter. The Sun is a huge thermonuclear reactor running on hydrogen. Of course, some of the energy it emits is propagated in space in the form of visible light, but it also emits radio, infrared and ultraviolet waves, X-rays, and even gamma rays during violent solar flares. In fact, the Sun emits radiation at all wavelengths, right across the electromagnetic spectrum. And this radiation travels at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. The Sun is just one of the 200 billion stars in our galaxy, which all emit radiation, amongst other things. Images taken by satellites show us a sky full of electromagnetic radiation. They have even led us to discover extremely intense X-ray and gamma-ray sources, which arise in the universe during violent events such as supernova explosions. A veritable shower of radiation reaches the Earth. Reaches? Well, not exactly, luckily for us, because most of the rays are stopped, absorbed by the various parts of the atmosphere. Some of the infrared rays are absorbed by water vapor, some ultraviolet rays by the ozone layer, and X-rays and gamma rays by oxygen. It wasn't until the 1960s, and the start of man's conquest of space, that we understood that the atmosphere acts as an effective shield against X-rays and gamma rays, a shield that is involved in our radiation protection. The sun does not just emit electromagnetic radiation, it also loses matter. This image, taken by one of the instruments on board SOHO, shows the streams of particles ejected by the corona. This is solar wind, which sometimes blows at storm force during solar flares. This image, taken with another instrument on board SOHO, is interesting because an artificial cover hides the solar disk, which is too dazzling. The huge plumes, which will disappear into space across hundreds of thousands of kilometers, can therefore be seen more clearly. During solar flares, bursts of particles irradiate the space probe. They leave long traces on the camera's sensor. Just imagine, if there were a man in the cabin, he would be killed in minutes. The solar wind is only one part of the stream of particles which crisscross our galaxy in all directions, and which are called cosmic radiation. Earth, like the other planets, is exposed to this radiation. But it has a form of defense, which acts like a huge magnet surrounded by a magnetic field called the magnetosphere. The lines of force deflect the particles, which pass on either side. This magnetic shield does, however, have a few weak points. Firstly, at the poles, where the particles penetrate via a sort of funnel and hit the upper atmosphere. Under this bombardment, the rarefied air lights up like neon tubes, causing the polar aurora, known as the aurora borealis in the north and aurora australis in the south. These magical colors are produced by the phenomenon of fluorescence. The magnetic shield is not 100% impermeable all around the Earth. It lets some particles through. When one of these particles arrives 30 or so kilometers above us, the only remaining barrier is the air layer. Even so, it is a layer of air equivalent to a 10 meter thick wall of water. The particle collides with the first oxygen and nitrogen atoms. The products of the collision then collide with other atoms, causing bursts of secondary particles, some of which reach the ground. An average of 240 particles per square meter fall on France every second. This exposure caused by cosmic radiation 
accounts for 10% of the naturally originating exposure to which we are all subjected. It is obvious that the tremendous protection provided by the atmosphere decreases very quickly the higher we get. So the hillwalker receives twice the exposure due to cosmic radiation at a height of 1500 meters and four times as much at 3000 meters. And a passenger in an aircraft cruising at 10,000 meters receives 100 times the exposure. An airline pilot who does 700 hours flying a year receives an exposure that is greater than the limit permitted for the public. The exposure of all air crews is therefore monitored. And what about astronauts? The answer is not straightforward, as it all depends on the mission. Space stations orbiting at an altitude of 400 kilometers are a long way above the atmosphere, but are still below the shield of the magnetosphere. Recorded exposure levels are 1,000 times higher than those received on the Earth, which is not insignificant. An astronaut reaches the annual exposure limit for a worker in the nuclear industry in just one month. And the time spent in space stations regularly exceeds six months. The record being held by the Russian Valery Polyakov, who stayed on Mir for more than a year. Astronauts are by far the most exposed to radiation risks. Only 24 people have been further than 1,000 kilometers from Earth, crossing the magnetic shield. They are the astronauts of the Apollo program lunar missions between 1968 and 1972. The Moon, which is 380,000 kilometers away, has neither an atmosphere nor a magnetosphere. With no protection, it is therefore exposed to the solar wind particles. Of course, this wind is not even strong enough to fly a flag, but it is continuously eroding the moon's surface and covering it with a layer of dust in which astronauts' footprints remain. Exposure to cosmic radiation on the moon is 5,000 times greater than that observed on Earth. But the 12 men who walked on the moon did not suffer any ill effects because they only stayed there for three days at most. There is, however, a real danger. Remember the Apollo 16 and Apollo 17 missions in 1972. In April, John Young and Charles Duke drove around freely on the moon. In December, Eugene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt were the last to land there. They all returned unscathed, but they were lucky, because between these two missions, there was an enormous solar storm. On August 4th, an intense stream of particles swept through interplanetary space. If the flare had taken place during a moonwalk, the astronauts would very probably have received a fatal dose of radiation, even inside their space capsule they would have suffered damage to their blood counts and genetic makeup. The environment was known to be inhospitable, and after this episode, it was discovered to be hostile. With the current state of technology, during a two-year return journey, a Mars Voyager would receive exposure levels 40 times greater than the limit permitted for a worker in the nuclear industry in Europe. Unless a revolutionary shield can be developed, or the journey speeded up, Manned flight to the Red Planet seems very difficult to imagine today from the point of view of radiation protection. The 1970s, when colonization of the Moon and Mars was predicted by 2000, seems a very long time ago. It has not been possible to take up this technical and financial challenge. A breathable atmosphere? Controlled temperature? A glass shield could perhaps have protected this beautiful city from everything, but not from cosmic radiation.